to uh, come here tonight because Jimmy Vaca told them to, please come back. Uh, do it again. Uh, we're, we're, we're so excited to see everybody. There are so many new faces here. I'm trying to like scroll and like see if I, like I can even keep track of all this, but it's, it's honestly impossible. This is so wonderful. This is so great. Um, and I'm really excited to, and I'm really excited to get into it with some of our nominees tonight. Um, so obviously we are less than 50 days away from the general election. 50 days, that is 50 days ago, we were in a completely different world. The primary hadn't happened or maybe it had just finished, but we were in a completely different world now. But folks, long story short, this is it. This is it. Um, there is so much at stake in the upcoming election. There's so much at stake, but I have so much faith because we are mobilizing to elect candidates like the ones that we have with us tonight. We are mobilizing to protect our democratic values that we worked so hard to gain in 2018 and that we may have took for granted in 2016 where we didn't think that something so catastrophic could happen like the election of uh, Donald Trump. Um, and the effects, you know, we are feeling the effects now, collectively, harder than anybody would have ever imagined us feeling these effects. There are almost 200,000 Americans dead from the COVID-19 pandemic. A complete absence of leadership at the federal level has gotten us in this position. And don't we know it more than anybody else? Our borough suffered harder than any other place in this country and arguably on this planet. The, the, the notion that the sounds that stuck with us from March into April were the sounds of sirens, of ambulances, videos of refrigerated morgue trucks at hospitals. Folks, it did not have to be like this. We know that. Everybody here plays a crucial role in ensuring that come November 4th, we can get ourselves out of this mess. That we can elect the candidates that we have here with us tonight. The Jennifer Raj Kumars, the Zohar Mamdani's, the Jessica Gonzalez Rojas's, the Khalil Anderson's, the Joe Biden's, the Kamala Harris's, the senators throughout the Midwest that are gonna give us the Senate. The, the congressional candidates on Long Island that are gonna take seats from these Republicans who are causing so much progress to be stalled. There are 400 bills on Senator Mitch McConnell's desk right now, waiting to be signed by a Democratic president and waiting to be voted on by a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. And that is why that amongst all of the despair and amongst all the trauma that everybody here had to go through together, I have that optimism because we have each other and we have, and as long as we have each other and as long as we have us, that gives me hope because we know that we have to phone bank. We know that we have to send texts. We know that we have to do postcards. We know that we have to do our part in New York because as much as Trump likes to play, that he's gonna win in New York. And by all means, let him spend all of his money trying to win New York. Fantastic strategy, keep it up. Um, we're gonna do the work. We're not gonna take our eye off the ball. And that's why nights like tonight are so exciting because we have four candidates here who embody the kind of grassroots, diverse, beautiful coalitions that are gonna deliver us the White House and are gonna realign our politics moving forward. Um, so that's my little well, spiel well, for tonight. We'll get we'll get yeah. um, and I don't wanna waste any more time. Um, I know our candidates have to be at different places and do different things. Um, 
So without further ado, I would like to um, introduce Zohar, Zo, I'm sorry, Zoran Mamdani, the assembly member elect from Astoria um, to give some opening remarks about his campaign and his journey and just to say hi to the folks. Hi, Zoran. Hi, Danny, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I also just want to thank Jackie um, for help in, in, in setting this up and getting me situated. Uh, it, is, it is a pleasure to be here with, with all of you. And I, I apologize for the fact that I have to run off um, quite, quite shortly. But I think in, in terms of just some reflections, you know, um, what you said, Danny, really resonated with me with regards to the, the soundtrack of our lives um, when this pandemic first hit and, and trying to move past that, that period of time where, where sirens was, was all that we heard. Um, and I think that for me, one thing that I kind of wanted to talk about today is, um, is the crises that this pandemic has laid bare. Those are the crises that motivate myself and, and many, if not all of the other candidates on this call um, about you know, running for office and getting to work because what we've seen in each one of our districts, what I can say I've seen here in Astoria is that these crises existed far before the pandemic. For me, um, you, know, you mentioned what was it that, that kind of pushed me to run or brought me to run um, I was a foreclosure prevention housing counselor at Chaya CDC. I worked in the Jackson Heights and Richmond Hill offices, and I worked with low to moderate income homeowners across the borough of Queens, um, predominantly homeowners of color. And in my work, it was my job to put people's lives back together after they'd been broken into a million pieces, typically through issues such as loss of employment, healthcare emergencies, or um, an unforeseen issue within the family. And the reason that I ran was because I see the prospect of being a legislator and of passing legislation that it holds forth the possibility of ensuring people's lives are never broken in the first place. Uh, and I think that for me, you know, um, it, I, I think it's important to say that I, I see the, common, the commonality between all of those different kinds of issues which can plunge someone's life into crisis. I see the commonality being capitalism. And, um, for me, what I'm fighting for is not simply to resolve these kinds of crises, but I'm, I'm very much a socialist, and and that is kind of the political ideology that underpins um, underpins my political vision. Um, it's one thing to understand the limitations of doing individual work at a service level and, and seeing the prospect of what you can do as a legislator, but uh, it's another thing to actually believe it and take action on it. And um, and the reason that I ran was because a friend of mine actually asked me to run. And, uh, and I, I bring that up just to say that there are many of us who, especially with, with regards to an older generation, um, the, the typical response is to wait your turn, the typical response is to take your time and pay your dues. And it takes the courage of someone to tell you that you can believe and tell you that you can look past those kinds of restrictions and understand them as artificial. And I know that this is the, you know, I know that young is in the title um, of, of this organization. And what I would just say to, to many others is that, um, you know, the world is on fire and we don't really have time to, to, to take time. And if there is something that motivates you, if there is an issue that you feel is, is crying out for an answer that hasn't been given and you feel motivated and you feel like you have something to offer it, don't wait for anyone's permission. Uh, because I know I would not be on this call if I had. And, um, and, and I encourage you to, to follow that instinct and I encourage you to, to listen to the friends around you who tell you that your time is now. Um, I, will, I will hand it back over to you, Danny. Um, I, I sadly have to go in a couple of minutes, but maybe if there's time for a question or two, uh, however you'd like to, to take it. Um, yeah, I think um, we have a couple folks here right now. So I guess we can drop in one quick question um, before you have to leave. Um, so right now, this is a question from uh, the audience. So fundraising for state campaigns currently have no matching funds um, and it creates an economic barrier for folks. So what is your stance on matching funds and how do you think that would impact our elections? 
I think we absolutely have to have matching funds. I think that the lack of matching funds puts um, makes class a major determinant in who can run and who can succeed when it comes to running for office. You know, there, I, I worked until January and then I took time away from my job. And one of the major reasons I could do so was because I knew that if I ran out of my savings, uh, my family would be able to support me. And that is not a luxury that many people have. And we should not have that kind of a reality play a role in determining who is able to commit more time to their campaigns. I remember that for the first fundraiser I had, it was actually in Bay Ridge. And I took a Revel, um, I took a Revel, like e -bike, I don't know what you call it, like a motorbike um, scooter. I took a Revel scooter from Astoria to Sunset Park because the trains are horrible. And I actually got into an accident on the way there um, trying to avert a manhole that was deeper than I expected and it was raining. And my first thought after I uh, picked myself up off the ground and put my helmet back on was that we really fucking need public financing so <laughs> that I don't have to get on a Revel and go across the five boroughs to raise money so that I can run a campaign for state assembly. Um, I think city council has it much better and, and they, they're, they're much smarter with the way that they do it. I really hope to be a part of making it a reality at the state level. Um, sadly, I have to run off, but it has been a pleasure. And, uh, and I look forward to, to meeting many of you in person and, and I wish you the best um, for the rest of the meeting and, and for beyond. Thanks, Oran. Uh, likewise, you def rule of thumb, you definitely shouldn't have to die raising money to run for office in New York City. That definitely should not be an obstacle. Um, but thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Hopefully you can come to our summer bash next week. We'll see. Everybody should come to our summer bash next week. We have tickets that are already on sale. They're $15 for five extra dollars. You can get a nice sticker. QCYD logo sticker, which of course is our beautiful Queens Unisphere. Um, so come and join us next week, folks. We're a good bunch. Anyway, um, so speaking next, I would like to introduce our youngest assembly member um, who also happens to uh, be uh, the neighboring assembly member in the district and the one that I work in. He represents, he's going to represent the 31st assembly district in the future. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce a future assembly member, Khalil Anderson. Khalil, are you on? Yes, yes. Good evening, Danny. How are you? I'm all right, Khalil. How you doing? Good, good. I'm on the road. <laughs> That's good, man. That's good. It's busy, right? Yep, 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 yep. Um, so why don't you give us some opening remarks and kind of tell us what inspired you to run and what you see for your goals for um, this upcoming year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, QCYD. Uh, thank you so much to uh, my fellow uh, future colleagues, and primary winners um, who stepped out. Uh, on a leap of faith, uh, faith that people uh, in our various districts would believe in a message of change, believe in a message that um, the neighborhoods that we've served uh, for as long as we've served, um, you know, can, can move in a different direction. So um, my, my name is Khalil Anderson and I am um, the Democratic and Working Families Party nominee uh, for the New York State Assembly in District 31. And I'm honored to have taken that leap of faith to take that Obama challenge, if you will, um, to run for office, not knowing how money would be raised, uh, not knowing, um, you know, the, the grind that would, it would take um, to run a COVID campaign, not knowing um, the grit, you know, that came with um, grit and creativity that came with running a COVID campaign. And part of the reasons uh, why I, I was inspired to run for office is because, you know, my my neighborhood, my community, where I've grown up and where I've been living for the last 15 years has been left behind and, and, and forgotten about in many ways, in many aspects. Our schools are struggling. Yeah. Our young people don't have recreation. Uh, you know, our academic opportunities are, are limited. Just one in four young people in the 31st Assembly District uh, attain college uh, a level degree, whether it's associate's or bachelor's degree. Um, you know, we have all these crises. We have public housing that's failing uh, those fam the, the thousands of families that live in them. And what inspired me to run is that as an activist and an advocate, 
that's been on the ground uh, in the Rockaway section of my district and, and different parts of Southeast Queens, you know, advocating for a new fight, advocating for a better uh, a way forward for, for a district that is, again, left behind and forgotten about, but separate from that, geographically and politically isolated. Uh, and that's why our, our, our model and, our, and our, our, you know, slogan was a new fight together because we truly believe that um, we're stronger together as a community uh, and we're fighting, we're fighting all the same fights, but we're doing it in separate silos and, and bringing Rosedale, Springfield, the Rockaways where I call home and South Olson together uh, as one. Uh, fighting on one accord for all the issues that we hold near and dear and all the issues that I just mentioned is a better way forward. My attachment to the community and why, you know, why I, I felt the need to, to stand up uh, for this community, you know, also comes from just seeing how many uh, progressive and and, and uh, vision-centered candidates, you know, have taken on the powers that be in the moment uh, where our communities are, are not receiving their fair share. Uh, and in this moment, insert a vision of hope uh, and a vision, you know, where a district can live and fight another day. Sorry. Um, thanks so much, Khalil. Um, it, so I know I say this every time that we speak and every time that we see each other through either a Zoom or whatever, but Khalil is literally the reason why this organization exists. Like we manifest our dreams to come up so like up somebody like Khalil can fill them. It's unbelievable. Just like a young person who cared about their community, wanted to be empowered and took the challenge and ran for office. That is what this organization is about. And so thank you for joining us, Khalil. We're gonna hear more from you during our question and answer session. Um, so next in our alphabetical order is um, a, uh, candidate Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, um, who faced a very difficult primary um, and we're so glad that you're able to join us here tonight. Uh, hi, Jessica, thank you. And why don't you give us some uh, opening remarks? Well, thank you, Danny, for having me. And thank you for all the young Dems. I think I'm the oldest Dem here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was actually a member of the Queens Young Dems, but it was probably like 2001, 2002. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yes. But uh, I, the organization is, is one that's really important to me and um, humble to be part of this this crew over here with these amazing other colleagues who are uh, coming up with me at Albany soon. Um, so my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I um, have lived in my community for over 20 years, 21 years in fact, um, and worked here even longer than I lived here. Um, and I decided to run for office because I felt like we weren't being represented by the, the member that was in power. Um, so to, to out my age, I was born in 1976. In 1976, Ivan Lafayette was elected to represent the 34th Assembly District. He stayed in power until 2008. That's 32 years. He retired in a way in which they, he was able to appoint his successor. His successor uh, in 2008 was Michael Dendecker, who remained in power without ever having a primary challenge. So this is sort of, you know, classic queens. <laughs> um, and, you know, when in 2018, when I saw um, the election of uh, Jessica Ramos, who's our state senator, who knocked out a member of the IDC, and I saw my neighbor, neighboring assemblywoman, Catalina Cruz, who was a, a dreamer, and, um, and then my congresswoman, who's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, like these three fierce Latinas, like step up, raise their hand, and fight a really difficult fight to obtain the, the seat and the role that they have, it was really inspiring to see that happen in my community. Um, I've been a lifelong activist. Um, and back in 1999, I was a co-founder of an organization, hopefully that many of you are familiar with, called New Immigrant Community Empowerment. 
um, NICE for short. Um, it was an immigrant justice organization and one in which I put my like heart and soul into. We were like super scrappy back in the day and we were able to, you know, now form an organization that is doing amazing, amazing work, has an office. I mean, we used to meet in like, you know, people's basements and uh, we had an office in a basement of a Chinese restaurant on Roosevelt Avenue. And now we have like a full fledged worker center. Um, so that's the type of activism I'd been involved in, in my community. And, you know, I never really had aspirations to run for office. I had been working in the advocacy field for so long. And for the last 13 years, I've been running an organization called the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, where I got to fight for, at the intersections of reproductive justice, uh, immigration, uh, Latina civil rights, uh, LGBTQ liberation. And it was like my dream to do intersectional, you know, uh, grassroots organizing for an organization that worked not just here in New York, but across the country. Um, but doing advocacy work showed um, the reality that our representatives often don't represent us. So part of my work with the Latina Institute and, and with NICE and with other organizations I've been involved in is actually doing you know, community organizing around particular issues and oftentimes going up to Albany or going down to DC um, and fighting for the policies that we believe would best serve our communities, right? And I know that Oh, and I believe that the solutions lie in the communities who are most impacted by often the horrific policies that we are experiencing. And what I learned after 13 years of doing policy, actually longer, 20 years, 20 years of doing policy advocacy um, for different movements, it was like, we just need better elected officials. Um, and again, fast forward to 2018, seeing all these fierce Latinas, you know, take down, you know, these, these, um, these machine structures right, to, to be new voices and to be bold voices and to be authentic voices for our community. You know, people started coming back to me and being like, hey, Jessica, you should think about running. And it was sort of like, is Den Decker still there? <laughs> uh, after being there for so long, right? So, you know, it, it took a lot of convincing as Zahran said, like someone had to ask him. And for me, it was actually a lot of people had to ask me because again, I love advocacy work. I like being sort of the thorn in the side of elected officials. I didn't actually wanna be an elected official, um, but it was very clear that we weren't being well represented by our current uh, assembly member and that there was an opportunity for real fresh new voices to kind of add to the collective, like the, the change that we saw in 2018. And one example of what that means is, and I'll give you a, a very clear example, in 2006, when I started at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, um, one of the fights that we were fighting for was something called the Reproductive Health Act, which would codify Roe v. Wade and take it out of like the penal code, which, you know, New York were like, oh yeah, abortion's protected, but actually it was, it was not protected and we had to actually, you know, create legislation to pass these issues. And, um, you know, I, so in 2006, we go up to Albany, we do advocacy, we bring community members, Latina, Latinxes, like up to Albany to fight for this issue every single year. You know, we saw different formations of it. It was part of Cuomo's 10 point women's plan a couple of years ago. It fell apart because of that one issue. And then here we go, 2018, we elect all these badasses, right? 2019, when they start session, the Reproductive Health Act, right, after 12 years, at least in my memory of it being introducing and fail, um, was introduced, signed, uh, like passed and signed by the governor within two weeks, <laughs> two weeks by the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. And that point was when I was like, I could, I could, I could do this, right? So, you know, and, and for those of you, again, I'm a little bit older. Um, I have like a, a career that, you know, I was at the uh, executive director you know, I was making good money. I'm gonna take a huge pay cut. I have a nine-year-old child that I'm gonna be away from. Like there's actual real sacrifices in running for office. As Zoran said, like, you know, in Khalil, right? It's just hard to like raise money and be out there, right? But, but, but the ability to create systemic change is incredibly exciting and incredibly humbling. Um, and, and what I believe our, our community and our borough and our state and our city need in this moment. So, you know, I raised my hand. Who knew it would be a five-way race, uh, again, against a 12-year incumbent uh, in the middle of a global pandemic? 
I didn't, I didn't sign up for that, but here I am. Uh, I am both the Democratic uh, elect, a uh, nominee elect, and also the Working Families nominee elect. So I am super, super excited to, to be here and to be, you know, uh, ready to kind of jump into this fight. Um, I've been fighting the fight, but in a, this new capacity, um, I'm already getting to work. And um, again, super excited to, to be part of this conversation because it is it is the young people that it's gonna like really change the game and change the narrative and push for issues that impact our lives. Um, and I am I will like have a coffee or a Zoom call or whatever with anyone who's actually thinking about running because I'm happy to share my story and more details of the story that you know uh, we don't have time for today. But it, it it's really hard. It's a huge sacrifice, but um, I, I believe it will all be worth it when we're able to create the change that we need for our communities. So thank you. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Um, we're definitely gonna have some more questions for you, um, but thank you so much for your words. I mean, you're so right. It's, it, it's hard and it is such a sacrifice and it was such a big race, but um, the opportunity to bring change is why we're all here, right? That, that should be the driving factor to everything that we do as young Democrats, as, as elected officials, that ability to do that is, is, is special and we have to harness it the right way. Um, so without further ado, um, we have the Democratic nominee for the 37th Assembly District, which is just north of the one I work in, in uh, Rockaway Beach. 38th, and, uh, 38th. 38th, sorry about that. Um, and we have with us tonight, Jennifer Rajkumar. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Danny. Uh, it's great to be here with you guys. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Congratulations to all the terrific nominees. I'm so excited to work with this incredible group. Uh, so I used to be the legal director of the New York State Young Democrats. Uh, and I am so thrilled to be back again here with the Young Democrats. Um, of course, now I'm like 800 years old. And I think like a, a couple of election cycles will do that to you. So I stand here before you as your 800 year old nominee. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, I think I got you beat though. I think <laughs> the um, So uh, I uh, am very proud to be the first uh, South Asian woman elected to a government office in New York state, but I'm certainly not the last one. Okay? And I know that we all know a lot of young talent that I'm eager to help bring up. Um, and so, I guess I want to start with my social justice journey. So my family is from India and my parents immigrated to the US to South Queens in a di the district I now represent. And they immigrated here with just $300 and a suitcase and got their start in America. My mom was actually born in a mud hut in India. Uh, and I decided to dedicate my life to social justice and giving back. And uh, as I grew up, I grew up around books and I was just a kind of a very nerdy child. And one thing that I asked my history teacher once was, how come there are no women in the history textbook? It was just an innocent question. Why are there no women in this book? And he didn't have an answer. He said, let me tell you one thing. Behind every great man, there was a woman. But that made me a bit uncomfortable. You know, that wasn't good enough. And so I went studying women all throughout history. And I discovered the amazing story of the suffrage movement in America uh, that is now more widely known. Who here knows Alice Paul? Raise your hand on the Zoom call so I can see. Yeah, Jessica knows, of course. But now the story is more widely known, but the story of, of suffrage wasn't known. And I was in awe of American women who actually went on a hunger strike and went to prison just so that we could vote in this country. And you actually, you could see the New York Times from 1919 and the front page said a hunger striker is forcibly fed. She's fasted for 72 hours. So women were actually willing to die for the right to vote. And I'm just so in awe of people like her and their courage. Um, and so I also wanted to bring out the voices of people that are marginalized and voices that are not heard. And so I became a civil rights lawyer. I went to law school to uh, help domestic violence victims, to help workers who, we, who weren't being paid a fair wage. And uh, I 
became a class action litigation attorney. And what I wanted to do was represent classes of workers that weren't being treated fairly. And one of my first cases at a law school was on behalf of 5,000 women who were experiencing pregnancy discrimination. So basically, when these women got pregnant, they were effectively fired or demoted. That's illegal, but it happens all the time. And so we sued this multinational corporation on behalf of the women and actually won. Um, and uh, it became one of the largest jury awards in, in history. And I was so in awe of the courage of these women who put everything on the line to stand up and who were deposed and spoke about their experiences. And it was not very easy. Um, and so all of these experiences really inspired me, uh, but I wanted to experiment with policy, another lever of change. So I went to DC, Washington, DC. It was a great time to be there. It was Obama's first two years. There was a lot of energy in the city. And uh, I worked at the National Women's Law Center on policy. And as the Affordable uh, Care Act was being sculpted, uh, also known as Obamacare, we advocated for low-income women and families in that legislation, saying that if we're gonna revamp our healthcare system, we have to represent women and families who really need the support and the coverage. Um, and that was an incredible experience also because I got to meet so many young women who were eager to get their voices in the public sphere. And the culture was very much one of you should run, women should run, young people should run. We need new voices at the table. That was very much the spirit of the time. Um, and so I ended up uh, deciding to run for office unexpectedly. I did not plan it, but I realized that to get anything done, you really need power. So that's why I got politically involved. And I started um, by running for a district leader. And so what I did is uh, I, I was 28 at the time and I challenged a 28 year incumbent for district leader. And people basically said, well, she's a nice kid, but she has no shot. Uh, I, was, I was underestimated. Um, and uh, how did I start? I stood on a stump and there was basically eight people there as I stood on the stump. And I stood in, in front of the Statue of Liberty. There was a park where you could see the Statue of Liberty behind me. Because I said, as the daughter of immigrants, I need to announce from the Statue of Liberty. And it was only eight people, there was no press. Uh, and I just stood on the stump and said, I'm Jennifer Rajkumar, and I wanna run for district leader. And it felt very awkward uh, as a new candidate. Uh, the, I, I had the fear that my mind would go blank and all that I would hear is four score and seven years ago, you know, the words of Abraham Lincoln. So really it's just as a new candidate, you learn to come into your own and find your own voice. Of course, that's now like a million years ago um, and I'm used to it. And um, every day I find my own voice. I, I ran for a city council position while I was practicing law and um, it was against an incumbent. I came very close. I got 42% against an incumbent. It was a very good first run and I learned so much. I went to public housing from the top to the bottom. And I'll never forget the people that I met and the struggles that they face. Um, one thing that I will never forget is I passed a park once surrounded by public housing. And there was a, um, the park was a dump, by the way, the park was a dump. And in the middle of that park, there was a playground. And there was a boy on a swing around 11 years old, African-American, and he had the largest smile on his face, pure joy as he went on that swing. But he was in a park that was a dump. And I thought, what's going to happen to him? What's his life going to be like? Um, and I'll never forget that. I'll never forget him. It's seared on my heart. I'll never forget the stories of the people, the voices of the people are always gonna be in my mind forever. Um, but I lost that race and there was a super PAC that came into the race spending uh, about $300,000 uh, just to defeat me. So that's the story of ca campaign money in politics. I saw it firsthand, big money. Um, after that race, something unexpected happened. Um, the governor said, Jennifer, I want you to, I want you to uh, direct immigration now for the state of New York. So it was an interesting time. It was Trump's, Trump had just gotten elected to office. And so I was the director of immigration affairs for the state in the age of Trump. 
And so uh, when Trump enacted the Muslim ban, banning Muslims from, uh, banning people who are from Muslim majority countries from entering the US, um, that's when I started my job. And I actually called and I said, do you want me to start early? As soon as that executive order came down. So I did start early. And um, what I did was I designed a project, the first of its kind in the country, to make sure that all immigrants who can't afford a lawyer get one in New York State. And it was a $31 million project. We started it with zero dollars, but we're able to get the state to contribute third, to contribute millions of dollars and a few private foundations. And I'm really proud that New York is became the first state in the nation where no immigrant has to be alone and in detention or without access to a lawyer. Because the truth is, with a lawyer in an immigration proceeding, your chances of success increase by 14 times. And it's often life and death uh, for an immigrant when they're experiencing deportation. It's a life and death issue. Um, so at, in that role, working for the state, um, I got to travel all around the state. Um, I was here in my home in South Queens, but I was also up by the Canadian border on the farmlands, helping Guatemalan immigrants. And what I realized was that the voices of immigrants here in South Queens, where my family got its start, have not been heard. Um, and so I ran for the assembly seat. I sit here before you as the nominee. Um, it was an incredible experience. My district is 72% immigrant. And um, these uh, immigrant communities, South Asian and Latino immigrants mostly, uh, have, have really not been heard. Uh, this, my district here in South Queens is overlooked and underfunded. And I wanted to change that situation. We ran a energetic grassroots campaign um, against an incumbent. Um, and we ended up winning by 27 percentage points. Uh, which was the most of any challenger in the state this cycle. Um, and it's really, you know, was the people's victory for coming together and, and making this happen. Um, and during COVID, we shut down and ran a 24 seven coronavirus response team in Hindi, Punjabi, Bengali, Spanish, Polish, and Albanian. Um, and we had got doctors on the phone to talk to people who had COVID in their homes. Um, so in closing, um, I just wanted to say a few lessons I've learned. I want to share with you. The first is, I recommend experimenting with all the different levers of change. Because in my journey to make a difference in the lives of people, I tried policy, I tried representing people individually, I tried tra class action lawsuits, um, and I tried working in government um, for the executive. And what I learned was that, you know, you just gotta keep trying, never give up. Um, and also if you fail, if you lose a race, if you, if, if you suffer any defeat, get right back up and keep going. You know, it's, it's really, it's never the end. Um, as JFK says, one of my favorite quotes, JFK is the life of service is a constant test of your will. You're going to be constantly tested. But don't listen to the naysayers. Just get up and keep going. Um, and I will be here to support you all, you know, because the young Dems supported me every step of the way. So you don't have to do it alone. Um, the other thing um, is that I was, I was so pleasantly surprised to learn that allies come in, in all forms. Uh, some of my, my closest allies are different from me. Um, they're a lot younger, they're a lot, they're a lot older, uh, different ethnicities, different income levels. You never know where you may find an ally. So, so I would say stay open and build those bridges because life is, is full of surprises. And um, you know, as, as Bill Clinton famously said once, Politics is organized for fighting. You know, it's organized for two sides to fight against each other. But the truth is, most change actually actually happens simply by getting along. You know, so I thought that that was very um, insightful. And the last thing is really, I I believe I've come to believe that character is destiny. Um, just always be true to yourself. I would say, you know, when when you when you're at any table of power, you know, never uh, check your values at the door. I would say stay, stay true to yourself. Um, I think that that's very important. And I think that that um, always wins in the end. You know, you don't have to go anywhere just because the poll uh, and pick your fights. I would say don't pick fights against people. 
um, but pick fights against the larger, the larger issues. You know, my fights are against hunger, poverty, inequality. These are my, the fights I'm fighting. You know, it's, it's never personal. So always remember that, put that in perspective. And then I just wanna say, finally, you know, you belong at the table of power. We all belong at that table. Never doubt that for a second. You know, like as the famous saying goes, Shirley Chisholm, first black woman to run for president, first black Congress member. She said, if they don't give you a, a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, like get in that room. If, if you feel like you, people are shutting you out, you just knock on that door or, or just sneak into the room. Um, you know, you, you belong there and, and never doubt that for, never doubt that for a second. Like our voices are, are needed. And thank you so much. So, so glad to be here today. I'll take questions. My Great. mom says hi. Oh, hey, Shana. <laughs> hi. Shana uh, and I have worked together on many campaigns. And I also want to shout out to uh, District Leader Mufazal Hussein, who uh, also made history in my district this election by defeating an incumbent. And also a little, uh, I don't know if anybody, well, Mufazal will make this announcement if he wants to later on in this meeting. Um, but we're very proud of Mufazal and, uh, you know, you can share him with us, but we, we still need him a little bit. We still need Mufazal. Right, a little bit only, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I can't actually announce that until next month. So uh, I'll, I'll wait till next month. Okay, moving on. Um, so we have all of our candidates here tonight. Um, Zohan had to leave, but we have Jessica and Khalil here. So, um, I wanted to ask uh, Jessica a question first. Um, Jessica, you had a pretty tough primary. There were five. Um, there were five people running. A lot of them had different support from different constituencies. Um, all had pretty good intentions. Um, so, what is kind of the next step after a primary? And I think there are a lot of lessons that we could learn from that now. What are the next steps after a primary to unite a district that um, had so many different people running? How do you bring everybody together so you can achieve that common purpose that you were elected to execute? I think it's doing the work that needs to be done. Um, already I sat down with um, Joy Chowdhury who, um, you know, it was so interesting because in the beginning of the race, I anticipated it being like me versus the uh, longtime incumbent. Um, and then when it got more crowded, uh, I remember, you know, meeting with everybody and, um, and Joy and I had a um, really great conversation. Um, and for, you know, a lot of the reasons that Jennifer mentioned, you know, about making history and being a voice that represents your community you know, we sat down and he shared that, you know, he was running because he wanted to be a voice for his community. His community asked him to run. And I was like, you know what? I totally respect that. Like the South Asian community makes up almost 30% of the district and they've never had a, 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 a leader in our community. Uh, they had many leaders, but no representative. Um, so, you know, we, we, we always sort of maintain a positive relationship throughout. And I think it, it's, it's great that we're now coming together and planning events together. So just a couple of days ago, I joined him and actually Jennifer and many other um, Bangladeshi leaders and South Asian leaders um, to promote the census. Um, and we're actually planning an event this Sunday, uh, a census outreach um, event. Um, and it's about inviting all the other candidates, the people who um, raise their hand. Um, actually, I have to commend the uh, outgoing assembly member, Michael Dendecker. He reached out um, to set up time to um, support the transition. Um, because I think, as you mentioned, all our intentions are positive, right? We all wanna represent and serve our community. Um, and I, I am very grateful for the assembly member to reach out and say, hey, let's discuss the transition plan I assume you're going to win the general, and I actually do have a, a Republican opponent. And um, it's it's and let's talk about ways that we can continue supporting the work that's you know he's he started and is leading, and and I can continue. So we're actually going to do a joint um, paper shredding event. He's talked about uh, staffing transitions. Um, so there's actually been really positive um, outcomes in terms of. Um, relationship building and um, a, a colleague is there's a group of folks hosting a fundraiser and they 
actually invited many folks who are other candidates to into that, right? And many of them have signed up to be on the host committee. So that's a really genuine um, show of, of mending, um, you know, any divide. And I think the one thing I'll, I'll say, and I think it's important for any of us who are thinking about running for office, is that we shouldn't approach it as we're running against each other. We should approach it as we're all running for the same position. Um, and I think with the city council, and I hope that there'll be a little bit of a different approach. It won't be so contentious that, it, you know, with ranked choice voting coming up, it'll be a very different, I'm hoping it'll be a very different experience that people are just, you know, again, saying like, I hope I'm your first choice. If not, I hope I'm your second choice. You know, with the winner takes all strategy that we had to deal with, it's a little bit more difficult, but um, I think there's real opportunity for the future to hopefully not see as, as, as much of a contentious race. Um, but there's real bridge building that's happening now um, in our community. And um, again, I'm really grateful for those who have reached out um, and, and, you know, have come together and are actually showing support um, uh, of me in the candidacy because, you know, folks know why I run. I made my vision very clear, my platform very clear, and I plan to represent every single person in this district. Thank you. And uh, just a shout out uh, for the fundraiser tomorrow night of which we are on the host committee. Oh, um, yes. So we are definitely excited. Uh, Thank to, you. Of course, absolutely. We are definitely excited to be a part of that with you um, tomorrow night. So Khalil, um, you also ran in a very contested primary and our and the district that you represent is very spread out. And there's a lot of different constituencies within that. So what is, what do you think is important, you know, going into this next phase and as you transition into being an elected official that you need to do in order to bring, to same question, kind of bring your district together and um, push for that vision that you're trying to implement? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just given, uh, piggybacking off the context we gave, we, we did run a very uh, uh, we did have a very tough primary, uh, five people, six-way race, including me. Uh, and I also ran for uh, state committee man, uh, with, with head on, uh, two people race, not as crowded as the assembly race. Um, so, you know, definitely understanding that there are many constituencies across the, the 31st. And uh, we, we stretch all the way up from South uh, Richmond Hill, um, all the way down to uh, Rockaway Beach. and. To, you know, including JFK Airport, so it's a vast district. And we know um, that, again, my campaign slogan, again, was a new fight together, understanding that we were isolated, understanding that this, the issues are the same, whether you go to Rosedale or, or, or Springfield Gardens or the Rockaways, we still have issues of flooding, whether you go to South Ozone uh, or even other parts of Brookville and, and Laurelton, there's still the issue of, of being a transit desert and a food desert, all the issues uh, overlap, um, but the best way to bring this community, this geographically isolated community together is to look at ways uh, we can find similarities um, in those issues uh, and work on those issues collectively, work on fighting for community garden space, not just in the Rockaways, but also in South Ozone Park where, where those areas are food deserts, uh, fighting for better train service, not just uh, in South Richmond Hill, but also in Laurelton that struggles with um, transportation desert uh, uh, and the Rockaways that struggles with living in a transportation desert. So I think it's uniting us all on the issues that impact us. And thirdly, uh, looking at ways we can uh, you know, build a better and stronger infrastructure uh, as it relates to our transportation. Can you believe we have the world, one of the world's largest and most used airports in JFK airport in the heart of my district, but yet it's hard for folks who live in the district, who live around that airport to get to the airport. And so that's that's a, 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 a catch 22, if you will, um, that we're faced with in our district. Uh, and it doesn't it doesn't stop based off of where you live it, uh, uh, in that part of the district. Everyone has a struggle of getting to the economic engine of the district, which is JFK Airport. Uh, and, and it's just something that we're gonna work actively work to uh, build out and uh, unite folks and, and those issues, those are the ways we're going to bring this divided community together yep. and focus on the issues. So uh, thank you for that, Khalil. And um, 
I agree. As somebody who lives on the Rockaway Peninsula, I would love it for it to be easier <laughs> to get to the airport. It's very odd that we can't do that. So I would just like to make a quick shout out again uh, to Professor Jimmy Vaca. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Who, oh, no problem. Uh, uh, Professor, council member, would you like to say a couple words to everyone here tonight? I'm really impressed with all the uh, candidates. I really am honored to be among you. It's fantastic to hear their platforms and how they got involved and how they want to do more by becoming an elected official. Uh, that's the objective of being an elected official. It's the determination to do more and the reward you get when you get accomplishments for the city, state, and for your and for your constituents, of course. So I'm I'm honored um, to be here, and so many of my students. I want to thank them for coming. Um, they're in my urban studies classes at Queens College. We have a great department, and um, the students really are are getting more and more engaged, and that's what we need. We need young people to get engaged, and seeing uh, this representation tonight of the new electeds really makes me feel that uh, we have a we have good days ahead. We have good people representing uh, us in Albany. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council member. Thank and you. It's true. And it's true. Young people do need to get involved. Young people do need to take that action. And that's why I will once again plug uh, signing up to be a member of QCYD. Uh, we provide a lot of opportunities to do that. Uh, over the next month, especially, we're going to be doing some intense fun, uh, phone banking um, into swing districts uh, all across the state, all across the country. Um, so join us. And also, if you can join us for our summer bash next week, all the proceeds that we raise go to our uh, programming. And that includes Election Day GOTV materials. It includes... Um, donations to can to great candidates like Jessica Gonzalez Rojas and we've also donated to Khalil. So like we're, you know, that's where that's where this goes. It goes to empowering young people. It goes to empowering progressive Democrats. Um, so um, again, please come join us. Um, so Jennifer, this question is for you. Um, historically, your district had some of the lowest turnout of any assembly district in all of Queens. Um, so what, what was the key to kind of upping that and really creating a, a and activating a block of voters that had never been, um, really activated in that kind of way where you met with skepticism from the community? What were you, you know, how did you kind of navigate that? It was pure grassroots. I think that so much of the district had been really overlooked. Um, and we just were door knocking even last winter. Uh, I was reminiscing with my campaign manager recently about how we were door knocking literally uh, the day before Christmas uh, in the cold weather uh, in Richmond Hill to Guyanese families that had never received a door knock or anything of this kind, right? So uh, I think it was really just hardcore uh, grassroots in the freezing cold and then in the hot weather there was literally I was talking to a uh, part of to my team today and we were we were talking about how we could not feel our toes because it was freezing cold outside uh, it was like one of those movies where they're cl climbing a mountain like I cannot feel my toes I cannot feel my toes um, and you know we we had a lot of fun but we also really worked really hard just to to, to talk to every single voter. And then when COVID happened, we said, what are we gonna do? It's the last three months of the campaign. We can no longer make contact with voters. So what we did is we just aggressively, aggressively called. And um, we were able to form connections even with people we had we never met in person. Uh, we just, I think especially during COVID people were so isolated and needed so much help. And it was like a voice in the dark talking to someone on the phone. And it really bought us, the crisis bought me and the team closer to constituents than we've, we'd ever been before. Um, so it fostered closeness. So I guess the answer to how we increased turnout by so much was just pure hustling, that's it. 
And you know what? A lot of elections, especially grassroots elections, that's what it comes down to. Uh, the ones who put in the most hustle, that's usually where it goes. You have um, to see Jennifer's hustle. It is an intense hustle. Oh my gosh. And, and I have to say, Shayna, I've hustled with Shayna on the streets before. Um, this girl is nonstop. So everyone remember, if you're doing a campaign, you got to call Shayna Gorski. She's a dynamo. <laughs> oh, we, we love Shayna. We love Shayna. She is a dedicated member and an excellent contribution to whatever team she joins. Um, so this question is for anybody that wants to answer it. And it was submitted by uh, one of our um, members. So given the recent uptick in shootings throughout the city, how do we balance the needs of the community in ensuring that minority groups are not unjustly targeted by police practices while also balancing a commitment to public safety and quality of life? And it's whoever wants to take that one first. Um, this is Jessica. I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound 